Hello comrades and compatriots, my name is TB Skyne, and as promised, I am going to be doing videos on every single one of the community collaboration comics that Riot Games have been publishing. If you watched my previous video, you might know that I think they have maybe not been doing a fantastic job of promoting these comics and making them available to the general public to read, which I think is a crying shame because all of these are pretty damn good in their own right. This comic is Olaf vs. Everything. It's a comic that they've created in collaboration with Tom Barton. And artist doesn't have a Twitter handle, unfortunately, but I'll be linking to his Instagram, same as this post does, down in the description. The concept of this comic is simple enough. Olaf wants to fight something strong enough to kill him in glorious combat so that he can die a good death. That's literally his entire lore as it stands right now. He he wants to fight something strong so he can die and go to whatever the Rune Terra equivalent of Valhalla is supposed to be. So this comic takes that premise and runs with it, pitting him against pretty much whatever they can find a way to justify having him fight. He's gonna fight it. He fights Trundle and a bunch of ice trolls. He fights whatever the heck this thing is. I don't think it's Gnar, but it has kind of the same color scheme. Some kind of jungle monster. Then he fights a bunch of the pirate skins in uh, in Bilgewater. And then he gets sent along after having his ass handed to him by Yalawi, which Which I think is a nice little touch. There's not much depth to this premise, really. It's... Uh, as Riot themselves recognize, it is mostly an excuse to have Olaf running around just kicking the shit out of things and fighting and having cool fight scenes featuring Olaf. That, if you are someone who hungers for League of Legends lore, like for, for like meaningful, deep content that really explores the characters and, and tells some engaging stories, this is not the thing for you. That's kind of not what this is about. This thing is about Olaf fights a bunch of stuff. And it's awesome, because he's Viking with axes fighting shit. That's the concept. So how well do they execute on it? Well, I have some criticism, but overall, like I've already said, all of these community collaboration comics are really quite good. The first thing to notice about the art style Tom Barton uh, uses for this particular comic is that he uses... First of all, it's a very Western art style. It has some Eastern influences, because most things do these days, but it's a very Western art style. You have these very heavy, dark shadows um, used, in, used in the composition that are very typical of Western comics, superhero comics in particular, is where you'll get that kind of, you know, pure black sh shading going on with, uh, with these color lines. And the same thing goes for a lot of the ways in which the aesthetic is constructed. It, it reminds me... He uses some techniques that are perhaps more common with uh, manga and anime in, in the Eastern style, but which are presented in a way that is very Western. Something I've, I, something I've always kind of had trouble articulating is the difference in the way that Western comics and Eastern comics express action. And the simplest way to put it is that Eastern comics are a lot more fond of speed lines. And that is to say drawing lines indicating the direction and the intensity of the motion that they're depicting, whereas Western comics are more fond of the snapshot approach, is what I call it in a way, where it's like they take a picture of a scene, as though they were standing there with a camera, taking a snapshot of everybody in motion, where the action and the motion of what's going on is kind of implied by the relative positionings and the camera angles and whatever's going on, with much less of an emphasis on speed lines than you might see in Eastern comics. This is, at the very least, partially true for Olaf versus everything. If you take a look at here, for instance, um, these action scenes here, there's a very, very limited use of speed lines. You can see there's a little bit here to indicate that Olaf is rotating, but there's nothing to show, you know, that the speed with which trolls are falling as he knocks them down. You can see that their clothes and their posture indicates the direction of their motion, but Unlike something, if you saw a scene like this in an Eastern comic, there would absolutely be much more, many more impact panels and speed lines indicating exactly how much force and how hard something is hitting rather than the more static snapshot approach. And I don't think any approach is necessarily superior or inferior to any other. It's a question of how well you execute it. And Barton 
executes it quite well, I think. I, I do have some criticisms, but nonetheless, he executes it quite well. And the way that he presents action works very well with his highly exaggerated art style. This is very obvious here, for instance, when you see the trolls. These shapes are distorted, and so is Olaf, by the way. The shapes of the characters are heavily distorted, emphasizing their muscularity and how massive they are, with poses that, that aren't quite balanced and wouldn't really work, except that their anatomies are so exaggerated that he makes them work. And this, I think, is very much a stylistic choice. I don't think it's just the way that he happens to draw. I think, I think these are stylistic choices because... In emphasizing so strongly this the the bulky you know the, when, with the heart shadows the bulky muscular nature of what's going on it also emphasizes the crucial theme of Olaf which is violence 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 and violence that's that's very much what Olaf is about so this highly over exaggerated pumped up muscular style works very well for that purpose and it it, it interacts meaningfully with the theme of the comic which is just Olaf fights everything. All the time, fight, fight, fight. There's also some interesting stuff going on with the colors. If you notice, as we start out in the Freljot, note the skin tone and the and the relative color saturation of Olaf as we see him in the panels. Mostly it's very subdued. It's, it's very turned down. It's very blue shaded. And this persists for most of his fight with Trundle and the other uh, Frost Trolls. But as he lands in the jungle... Everything gets pumped up in intensity. Everything gets a little bit more saturated. Everything gets a little bit more colorful. And that's a very... It's a simple, but a very effective way to indicate that the temperature, the nature of the location has changed. This is a warmer, tropical, sort of more colorful setting than the frozen Freljord. So we pump up the colors just a little bit. And you can see it does the same here when it's nighttime. The colors get desaturated just a little bit again to indicate that... The surroundings are cooler, and you know there's there's less heat going on. Um, and he does something similar when it comes to indicating Olaf's state of mind. You can see here when he's in desperate combat, or not so much desperate because he's killing them easily. When he's in combat with all these monsters, you can see this red haze that's uh, that surrounds him, and that's something that happens again and again. It happens very early on in the comic as well, as indeed you can see. Uh, here, you can see this orange glow surrounding him, indicating Olaf's rage, which is, again, one of the primary motivators of the character. And he's not always angry when he's fighting. For instance, when he's fighting um, the big beastie here, that rage doesn't really come in. It, it doesn't seem to be particularly necessary for him to take down this monster. But when some people insult him in a Bilgewater bar, the orange comes back in a big way and you can see it surrounds him here it surrounds him here as he's charging at the others and it's very much it's a complete glow around him when he's completely kicking the ass of the bilgewater crew and once he gets knocked out by lawi you can see he's still trying to dominate the scene with his orange rage glow but the greens and the teals of Ilawi's power overwhelm him which gives us a visual indicator that for all his rage He's still just a rat in a cage. I couldn't resist, sorry. For all his rage, Ilawi has the upper hand. She's more powerful. Her color dominates the image. And any time that Olaf's color, the orange rage colors, dominate the image, that's when he's empowered. That's when he's strong. And again, this is very simple visual storytelling. It's the kind of thing that you will see in Marvel comics, for, for example, um, and in, in a lot of Western comics where we use color, which is uh, relatively uncommon in Eastern comics, but that's, it's just, it's just well executed because the presence of the orange glow of, of rage never really interferes with the rest of the aesthetic. It's not like it all of a sudden looks like he's been transported to a different universe. It is, it is managed quite well in a sense, in the, in a way that it doesn't, you know, mess with the environment. By the way, I just, I love that they are using alternate skins here. That it's not just Olaf versus the base model of everything, but Olaf versus various skins. Here's Bilgewater Maokai and, you know, uh, Bilgewater uh, Aatrox. I keep forgetting his name because he's so pointless. Bilgewater Aatrox, Bilgewater Garen, Bilgewater, not Riven, that's Quinn because she has the bird. 
seriously, I don't I don't play these champions, so I must support main. I think I think that's a really nice touch because something that is underexplored in League of Legends um, content essentially is those alternate fantasies that they keep presenting. Like, I literally made a webcomic for myself about the Star Guardians because I don't understand why Riot hasn't done this already. So criticisms. I've, I've been praising it a lot, so let's have some criticisms. It is very hasty. It's, it's kind of rushed, and not in the sense that they didn't put in effort on the pages, but in terms of how much the story wants to cover in the, in the space that it has available, it is kind of rushed. We have 12 pages available. These 12 pages are split over four locations. The Freljord at first, where he's fighting, then the jungle, then the Shaman's Cave, where Rise sends him on. And here, by the way, you get a real powerful demonstration of the distorted anatomy. You can see how Rise's tiny head and giant torso and enormous arm kind of emphasizing that this is this is a sort of a heightened weirdo universe. Rise's Cave, then Bilgewater. And Bilgewater itself has the docks location and the bar location. Like, all these locations that the comic has to juggle in such a short time, and all these characters that it wants Olaf to have fight scenes with, it feels very much like they developed the concept for the comic, and they thought get, had a brainstorm about, oh, it would be cool if you fought these guys, and it would be cool if you fought those guys, and it would be cool if you fought these guys, and those guys, and those guys, and then they were kind of desperate to be able to include all of it. Because, well, to be honest, I get the sense from a lot of the comics that Riot has commissioned that getting a season two is by no means a sure thing. It can, it really depends on audience uh, response. That's certainly Riot's general philosophy is that if the audience doesn't like it, they're not going to bother doing it anymore. Like they're they're going to pull back the content or they're you know going to stop making it. Um, so. It feels a little bit, and this is my interpretation, obviously, it's not something I know for a fact, it feels a little bit like the creators, both the publishers, like the people at Riot who commissioned it and the artists themselves were kind of desperate to fit as much in there as possible to really show off the full scope of the concept. But as a result, each part, which is very cool in and of itself, gets very limited screen time. We get three pages for fighting the frost trolls and the last page has to dedicate a substantial amount of screen space to the transition I, to explaining how Olaf gets from the frill yard to the jungle area and indeed the jungle area has to spend some time indeed an entire page explaining how he gets from the jungle to Ryze's cave and during that transition he doesn't really fight anything that's relevant to the League of Legends universe he doesn't fight any of the cool League of Legends people, he just fights a bunch of generic monsters um, that don't really advance the idea of Olaf fights everything um, as as a League of Legends event. Um, and this th and this is necessary. Like, if you want to transition a character between so many different scenes, you have to make some space to transition them from one to the other, or you get this weird jump cut, jump in time thing that that doesn't really work. And it's the same thing with the Bilgewater location. Three pages. And then you have to dedicate a page to setting up how it is Ilawi who transports him to whatever his next location is. And the upshot of this is that the fight scene with all the trolls, which is like a fucking rad concept, like Olaf versus a bunch of frost trolls, that sounds really cool, gets effectively two and a half pages of anything happening, of any action whatsoever. Um, and that's cool that's fine it's not like it's bad but it's like i would the, the whole concept of the comic is to explore how cool would it be if olaf fought trundle how cool would it be if olaf fought some bilgewater people how cool would it be if olaf fought a giant monster in the jungle and if the concept is to explore how cool this is then my thing would be then i mean honestly i would dedicate an entire season to each fight like 12 pages dedicated to the frost trolls 12 pages dedicated to the wolves and and the jungle monsters and hanging out with the with the you know the jungle league of legends skins there and 12 pages dedicated to fighting people in bilgewater with the final and first pages dedicated to you know the transitioning thing how did he get there how is he going to leave for the next location that's but that is asking a lot like this is a this is a concept thing this is a proof of concept that's supposed to show what's possible and 
if they wanted to commit to it like fully, like completely commit to it, that's what I would have said, make it six pages or 12 pages per fight and really just explore. Like think about how could Trundle use all of his abilities, all of his kit to fight Olaf? How could Olaf use all of his kit to fight Trundle? How do they interact when they're combat styles merge what does king's dom uh, king's domain the trundle the area thing he can do where he moves faster and becomes stronger what does that do in a in a fight like this versus olaf who can become unstoppable what does the ice pillar do like all of that fully explore the kit and the combat abilities of each character and explore how that interacts with what olaf can do that that would be my thing that's my primary criticism and that's a structural criticism and it's not to a certain extent, it's not a fair criticism because, like I said, it's a proof of concept. They're just trying to sell the concept and then maybe maybe later down the line they can take more time. Like once they know they have two or three more seasons to work with, that's when they can take a little bit more time to explore each one. But right now they only know that they have one season with the potential for a second. So of course they're going to cram as much in there as possible. So, second criticism. The action is sometimes a little bit hard to follow. For instance, here. What's supposed to be going on here is that Trundle is swinging madly at Olaf and he can't hit him because Olaf is just being way too quick um, and unstoppable. And that's what's being shown here is that Olaf, his real body is here and these are kind of after images to kind of show that he's moving fast all across the field. Here is where a bunch of speed lines would have been really useful. I would have liked to see a whole bunch of different speed lines around Trundle's club to show that he's doing multiple swings and he's not just kind of standing there after completing one swing, but to show that there are many swings going on. And I would have liked to see maybe some speed line blurring more on Olaf and his after images to really sell the idea that he's darting around, that that he that is not s static after images, but it's after images in motion. But here. I love this little sequence here, where he just kind of roar, and then he tunk, gives him one in the nose. That's really good. That doesn't need speed lines, but like intense action scenes like this, I would really like to see more speed lines. The same thing here. This is supposed to be Trundle, wham, 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 slamming him down into the ground over and over again. More speed lines could have been used here to sort of to indicate that fact. Um, and this is something that, that's kind of consistent across a lot of the fight scenes is that I personally, and this is very much a personal thing, I would like to see more usage of speed lines because here, for instance, you can see how the use of that speed line and the curvature of Sijuani's flail really sells that motion, but I would like to see it have some more effect on the monster, like some impact effect and stuff like that. That's just personal preference, but for me, I feel like the action in that sense could be made stronger with a more generous, with a with a more distortive use of speed lines. Like, let the speed lines distort the thing so that it looks like it's a thing in motion. Like, when you take a picture of something that's moving really fast and it gets all blurred out, that kind of effect could be used more. Anyway, that's about all I have to say about Season 1 of Olaf versus Everything. I really like it. You should really read it. There's going to be a link down in the description. Go take a look at it and just study the art really closely because there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here in terms of the artwork. A lot of interesting use of colors. And yeah, I like it. It gets a thumbs up and uh, I guess a B plus from me because it's pretty good, but it could be better. My name has been TB's Guy. If you have any comments, you should feel free to leave them down below. Uh, and I'll be back, hopefully tomorrow, taking a look at Crystal Quest, which I'm quite excited for because I am deeply in love with the art style in that comic. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good one.